Good evening. The television and radio stations of the United States and their affiliated stations are proud to provide facilities for a discussion of issues in the current political campaign by the two major candidates for the presidency. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. Today, our former President Kennedy is considered something of a martyr. His good looks, youth, and seeming approachability propelled him into the hearts of Americans across the country in the early 1960s. Perhaps that's why it seems so strange to most people that he wasn't really the favorite to win the 1960 presidential election. Until the presidential debates, that is. His opponent, Vice President Richard Nixon, certainly had a better track record. But if there was one thing Kennedy knew, it was how to woo the media. In this, the first televised presidential debate was a great place to show that off. During the period of rapid change in technology that occurred in the 1960s, the U.S. media's right to free press was taken to new heights with its newfound ability to drastically influence public opinion. This is highlighted by certain events that took place in the period, like the Kennedy-Nixon debates, which led up to the 1960 election, and later the Watergate scandal. As the first televised presidential debate, the 1960 debate that occurred in September is credited with swaying public opinion toward Kennedy. Over a decade later, the Watergate scandal emerged and showed the true power of the American media's new style of investigative reporting. On the day of the debate, a number of factors contributed to Nixon's downfall. From the knee injury he sustained earlier that day, to his bad makeup job, and the gray suit that seemed to make him fade into the background, Nixon looked sickly, while his opponent seemed to be the picture of health. Had this debate been broadcast using only radio coverage, none of this would have mattered. But the use of this new technology caused Americans to lose faith in their vice president. However, this wasn't the only political gaffe to injure the older candidate. Earlier that year in August, a comment made by President Eisenhower was taken out of context by Democrats and used in a persuasive ad against Nixon. When asked about some of the contributions that Nixon had made to the presidency, Eisenhower replied thoughtlessly. Every Republican politician wants you to believe that Richard Nixon is, quote, experienced. They even want you to believe that he has actually been making decisions in the White House. But listen to the man who should know best, the President of the United States. A reporter recently asked President Eisenhower this question about Mr. Nixon's experience. I just wondered if you could give us an example of a major idea of his that you had adopted in that role as the, as the decider and, uh, and final... Uh, if you give me a week, I might think of one. I don't remember. Because... <laughs> At the same press conference, President Eisenhower said, No one can make a decision except me. And as for any major ideas from Mr. Nixon... If you give me a week, I might think of one. I don't remember. President Eisenhower could not remember, but the voters will remember. For real leadership in the 60s, help elect Senator John F. Kennedy, President. While this was meant to reference the president's own exhaustion, this is just one instance where political figures' words have been used against them, something that has become increasingly prevalent in recent years. Regardless of whatever reasons caused the debate to fail for Nixon, the result was the same. While those tuning in on their radios generally agreed that Nixon was the victor, the over 70 million Americans watching on TV overwhelmingly found that Kennedy was the winner. The next few debates went better for Nixon, but the damage had already been done. When the time came for America to vote that November, Kennedy came through with a 0.2% lead over Nixon. When Nixon reflected on the debates two years later, he said, I should have remembered that a picture is worth a thousand words. It seems it must have been a learning experience for Nixon, because in 1969 he was elected president, but the media was not yet finished playing a role in his political life. In 1972, a break had occurred at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, D.C. This was the start of his downfall. Good evening. We have a mystery story out of Washington. Five people have been arrested and charged with breaking into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in the middle of the night. The Democratic National Committee is located in the Watergate office building. The burglars forced a stairwell door, then taped its latch open. The door, now part of police evidence, was noticed by one of the guards employed by the Watergate complex. At first, the police found nothing. Then they spied five men crouching behind some desks. Neither. The president, obviously, or anybody in the White House or anybody in authority in any of the committees working for the re-election of the president have any responsibility for it. Although Nixon claimed no involvement in the incident, his efforts to cover it up eventually led to the Watergate Senate hearings in 1974. 
Throughout the period between 1972 and 1974, the media dug into the case and revealed more than the political figures they tried to keep hidden. This was part of a new style of investigative or watchdog journalism that involved not just reporting the news, but finding it. Watergate. Senate hearings. To ensure complete live nationwide coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings, the three commercial television networks are rotating the daily coverage. I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency, and if the cancer was not removed, the president himself would be killed by it. By the spring of 1974, the Watergate affair was a full-blown scandal, as televised congressional hearings gradually uncovered the cover-up. Mr. Butterfield, are you aware of the installation of any listening devices in the Oval Office of the President? I was aware of listening devices, yes, sir. Are you aware of the installation of any devices on any of the telephones, first of all, the Oval Office? Yes, sir. Now, the tapes which you've mentioned, which are stored, are they stored by particular date? Yes, sir, they are. And so that if either Mr. Dean, Mr. Haldeman, Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Paulson had particular meetings in the Oval Office with the President on any particular dates that had been testified before this committee, there would be a tape recording with the President of that full conversation, would there not? Yes, sir. Good evening. This is the 37th time I have spoken to you from this office where so many decisions have been made that shape the history of this nation. Throughout the long and difficult period of Watergate, I have felt it was my duty to persevere, to make every possible effort to complete the term of office to which you elected me. In the past few days, however, it has become evident to me that I no longer have a strong enough political base in the Congress to justify continuing that effort. I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. But as president, I must put the interests of America first. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. Steve Bow came up to brief us on the entrance into the grand ballroom where we were to say goodbye to the official uh, administration people, the cabinet and uh, all the other top people in the administration, about 300 of them. And then he said, now the three television cameras will be here. And Mrs. Nixon said, not on your life. She said, after what they have done to us, I am not going to let them interfere in this last private meeting with our friends. Well, I had to disagree, and I said, no, we have to do it. We've got to do it for our friends. We've got to do it for the country. Then at noon, August 9, 1974, Richard Nixon boarded a helicopter to make history one last time as the only U.S. president to resign his office. Back in 1952, Richard Nixon's checker speech harnessed the power of television to save his career. 22 years later, television was there to chronicle his political self-destruction. Since the 60s, journalism and media has evolved beyond what we ever thought possible. Investigative journalism has brought down countless corrupt politicians and brought truly newsworthy stories to the public attention. In the six months after the Watergate scandal, the Washington Post published over 200 stories related to it. Newspapers like this have been crucial in expanding investigative journalism and fulfilling the responsibility to keep politics in line.